That lay between us How high the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name Into the night Then through the darkness Your loving kindness Tore through the shadow Of my soul is finished, the end is written, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The King of Kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. buried body began to breathe out of the darkness the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me then came the morning 
that sealed the promise your buried body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me jesus yours is the victory hallelujah praise the one who set me free hallelujah death has lost its grip on me you have broken every chain there's salvation in your name jesus christ my living hope jesus christ my living hope oh lord you are my living Hi, thanks for joining me today. Today we're going to talk about what can grow from tiny seeds. But before I talk to you about that, I want to read to you a scripture from the Bible. It's John uh, chapter 14, verses 12 through 14, and Jesus is speaking to you. I want you to listen real closely to God's word today. Jesus said, I am telling you the truth. If you believe in me, you will do what I do. Yes. You will even do greater things because I'm going to the Father. And Jesus is in heaven, seated by the Father at this time. And I will do whatever you ask for in my name so that the Father's glory will be shown through me. And if you ask for anything in my name, I will do it. Now let's think about what that means. You're a believer in Jesus, right? Okay, Jesus said, if you believe in him, you do what he would do. And that's what Christians ask each other. What would Jesus do? And then we do it. But what's really cool in here is that Jesus said, we're going to do even greater things than him. And you're thinking, those miracles, what does that mean? Well, this is pretty much what I think it means. He goes on to talk about us praying, praying in his name, asking him for things in relationship to what we do for him. We ask for his blessing and his power and his guidance on the things that we do. And then those things will be done so the Father is glorified. So let's look at some, some seed packets right now. Pretty soon people are going to be planting gardens. In just a few weeks it will be warm enough. And there might be vegetable gardens they might be planting or flower gardens. And maybe your family will be doing something like that. And in these packets are seeds of different sizes and shapes and colors and <clears throat> they will grow into the flowers and vegetables that will also of course have be different in appearance it's amazing how God blesses the growth of these little seeds and they can grow into big and beautiful plants as long as they have good soil and sunlight and water now you're familiar with apples you know how big an apple seed is what it looks like in here, it's not that big. When that seed is planted, it takes years and years and years for the tree to grow big enough to bear lots of fruit and lots of apples on it. I want you to think about that in relationship, relationship to the things you do for the Lord. That's the small acts of kindness that you do. Those things that Jesus tells you, tells you to do and you obey them and you go and do them. When you pray over those things, God will bless those things. And over time, we don't know how much time. It might be a day, a week. It might take years. We may not even see it in this lifetime. But the things we do in God's name that he blesses, he will produce wonderful, great fruit from it for his kingdom. So I want to encourage you, every day when you get up, keep asking God, okay, you have good works planned for me. What are they? But then add this step to it this time. Pray. Pray in Jesus' name for the blessing over the things that you do. And trust God to produce wonderful things for his glory. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for the good works you have planned for us. 
And Father, help us to remember to pray your blessing in Jesus' name on those works. And we pray that you would use them for your honor and glory and the growth of your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks so much for joining me today. Bye. I'd like to welcome you to now our eighth online message, uh, which is amazing when we think about it, how many we've gone through, and who knows how God's using all this uh, to work something much better. And again, that's going to fit into our, our message tonight, because or today, uh, when we talk about how God sends us into the world. And again, there's a slide up there that's uh, going to be showing a, a woman that I, I went to seminary with. She was getting her PhD. She was uh, from Nagaland, and her name was Kumla. And uh, she went on a mountain climbing trip to me, and I always thought, well, heck, she was probably born at this elevation. But anyway, she was a fantastic Christian. The Naga people had received Christ usually in the world, and uh, she was now training to go home and train them. And again, that's a, a picture of what we're talking about, about how we're sent into the world. And uh, Kumla was sent into the world, and uh, she had a wonderful witness. You can see that uh, precious smile on her. Anyway, but just like she was sent, she was sent into the world like Jesus was sent, like God sent his son. And that's what Jesus told us. And the rest of us, too, are sent into the world like his son, like Jesus. So we're going to learn how that works tonight. And uh, again, uh, we need to take a, a look at uh, what we're doing. So uh, let's move into the, the next picture here. And I, I want to tell you about um, how in Israel, uh, that was just a, uh, a real nexus time in my life. I was 19 years old, and uh, it was, God was just doing great things in my life. And here we see uh, we're heading out to the Red Sea here uh, from the Wadi uh, out of the Granite Block area of Sinai. And um, it's like uh, the road's opening, and, and we're on a journey, and we're going out into the world. And that's, that's what we're all doing right now. We're, we're all journeying out there. We're all in the world. Uh, but we need to know how we can be in the world like Jesus was, like the way he sent us into the world to be. And last week we talked about how we're a royal priesthood, how we're sent out to priests, and that's very much it. We're there to be connected with God ourselves, but to help connect people with God. That's what existence is all about. That's why people are around, to connect with God and to help others connect with God. And then there's also that reality that we who connect with God connect with each other as well. And uh, that's very powerful. And that's exactly what I believe Jesus is praying for, for us. He prayed for us as we were sent into the world like he was. And I, I want to go to that scripture text. <clears throat> the old chapter <clears throat> is Jesus' prayer for us. And uh, in chapter 17 of John, which I refer to a lot, and again, all these messages I have uh, connect with each other. And I hope you see those connections and, uh, you know, see how it all works together. So anyway, here we are. Let me read this to you uh, from uh, John chapter 17. And I'm just going to re read verses 13 through 19. Uh, if you get a chance, read the whole chapter and meditate on this. Again, this is Jesus' prayer for us being sent into the world. This is what he sees as important what he sees that we need. It's what Jesus says to help us to know how we're to be in the world and how we're to be sent forth, okay? So anyway, here it is. I'll start with 13 here. Now I am coming to you, and he's talking to the Father. I told them many things while I was with them in this world so they would be filled with my joy. I have given them your word. And the world hates them because they do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. We're not of the world. I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but to keep them safe from the evil one. They do not belong to this world any more than I do. Make them holy by your truth. Teach them your word 
which is truth. Just as you sent me into the world, I am sending them. That means you guys, that means all of us who really believe in God. All the believers are sent into the world and I give myself as a holy sacrifice for them. See, God's not holding anything back. He's giving everything to us. Think about that. He would not even withhold his own son. That's how important it is that we go into the world this way, how we go into the world this way. This is God giving his only son so we could go into the world this way so they can be made holy by your truth. So that, that's, that's why it's so important to be holy. Our significance, our need for significance is really met here. Holy means that we're connected with God, we're like God, we're godly. We are set apart as special, as different, as dedicated, as belonging to God. That's just amazing. And, and, and we need to know how to do this. How do we do this kind of... Uh, Living like Christ in the world, being in the world to, again, connect with God, connect other people to God, and to connect with those who are of God in a very special way. And, and that's, that's the reason for existence. That's the reason we're here. And we need to get in the center of that. Now, how, you know, how do we do that? Let me um, tell you a joke. This is a good one, okay? And it kind of helps with this. So... There was once these three preachers, and they really liked to hunt moose. And they had this tradition that every year they go moose hunting together. And so they went up to Canada where a lot of good moose hunting happens. And so they're in Canada. And they go out in this section they'd never been in before. Uh, but, you know, they, they've been out in Canada a number of times. But here they are. They fly out to this reserve area where they can hunt moose. And so they're out there, and they get the guide with them and everything. And wouldn't you know it, every preacher, all three of them, got a moose. But <clears throat> there they are in this one plane, and they, even with the uh, moose quartered and, and cleaned out, and, you know, and just the meat, that was a lot of weight. And uh, when the pilot looked at it, and he said, there's no way I can get the three of you and all this moose meat out of here. And uh, the three preachers kind of looked at each other, and they all said, well, I, I'll tell you what. Last time we did this, uh, we had more, more moose meat than this, and, and we're all over, all, we were able to fly out and with, with, one, with a plane like this. And, and they finally talked to the pilot into doing it, even though he didn't want to do it. Sure enough, they, they got running, and it was hard, and it was a hard, rumbly takeoff, and they got off, and they kind of like a crippled bird, they were taking off, and they're starting to gain a little attitude. And, but then all of a sudden, it, just, it was just too much weight for the plane, and, and the plane went down and crashed. And uh, they were all okay, and, and fortunately, and everything. And, and the pilot was looking at them, and the three preachers looked at each other, and they said, well, at least we got 100 feet farther than we did last year. Well, there you go. Um, it, it seems to me that most people have a plan for happiness, a plan for life, a plan for their existence that's very much like that. They uh, keep on doing what doesn't work. And one of the real realities is, is that people as a rule aren't really good at understanding what will make them happy. Uh, you know, you can talk to a lot of people about this. Uh, one of my favorite guys is Tony Robbins, and he sort of points that out well and some of this stuff you know, reflects his insight, which I think is totally in the Bible. And, and, and one of these insights is, is that um, the reason we're unhappy or the reason we can't find happiness is because our belief or our story of what will make us happy or our blueprint for what we need to really be happy doesn't match our current reality. If, if, if we want to be a pilot and we are blind and we have a cane and what we, we know we can't even get into the class and we have to be a pilot, we're going to be pretty sad because our plan for happiness, our plan for uh, our life isn't, gonna, isn't meeting reality. 
And I think you'll find if you're, if you're dissatisfied, if you're really upset with something in your life, um, you'll find that it's probably, it's not matching up with your plan, what you believe you need to be or do or have to be happy. And, and, and this is very much critical to how we go into the world that we understand that this is a plan that's from God. It's not an earthly plan. And what happens when we try to do God's work or his will or to live for God, not with his plan, we're going to crash every time. Now, we might be happy because we think we get a little farther or this is a little more interesting. But the results, the outcome will always be the same. And I think that's where the church is. So many people are. And I know that's where I've been. I mean, I struggle with this. That's how I, I get these ideas. But anyway, here we are. We have a chance to go into the world like Jesus and with the power and the joy and the reality of God. But it only happens if we're following God's plan for happiness, God's plan for life, God's way of being in this world and making it significant and meaningful, making it where we belong, where we really have a love and, and, and a reality that is impervious to the situations and the slings and arrows of outrageous misfortune that can weather whatever happens in this changing and varied world. And when we're in God's plan, that's exactly what happens. It's immune to that. Uh, Jesus said it himself. He says, the joy that I give you, the world can't take away. It can't take it away because you're not in their plan. You're not living life according to their beliefs, according to what they think that's going to make them happy. You're living in a way that God says will make you happy, that God says you were made for, that's your DNA, that that's why you exist, your existential reason, okay? Whatever it is, it's, it, it's, it's the whole of, of life. And, and God knows best how to match that with a plan that's real, that's right, that will pay off and is immune to what the earth or world can take away and, to, and, and what it tries to give. Now, what happens is as long as we try to work the world's plan and God's plan, we're going to be frustrated. But when we start working in God's plan, when we make that our center, when we make that our continual connection with life and how we carry out each day, then we enter into a happiness. We realize that we're sent in the world. We have meaning. We have a, a sense of significance, uh, belonging. We have a sense of love. We have an excitement. Um, and yet we have a security. And all those things are coming from a plan that is beyond this world. It's a plan from God himself for us. And it's then that God can work all things to the good for those that love God and are calling according to his purpose. And basically, loving God and being called according to his purpose is to be in his plan, believing his plan, knowing his plan, trusting his plan. And how do we know that plan? There's two things that are just essential, and we see it ringing throughout uh, this whole prayer in chapter 17 of John, as well as the section I, I read for you there, that there's two things. One, we always have to begin and, and, and maintain a, a hallowing of who God is. You know, Jesus began the Lord's Prayer not by accident to say, hallowed be your name. Why is that? It says, your plan wins, God. That's what it's saying. God, you, your way, who you are, wins. That's what it's all about. That's, that's what I choose. That's what I believe in. That's what I follow. That's how I'm going to do this life, by hallowing by recognizing, by honoring, by worshiping, by knowing your identity, knowing who you are, I'm going to be able to experience a blueprint for happiness, a life that matters, a life that is sent with purpose, just like Jesus. Now, it's important to notice that there's a good comparison there because in earthly terms, Jesus looked like a failure. Really, when you think about it, you got, you, got, you got to press into this and realize, what, you know, what did he accomplish? 
Well, he's betrayed by one of his own. His, his disciples had no status, had no government. He was cruelly and, and, and shamefully treated, uh, disgraced before everybody in public. He was, he was reduced to a corpse. Uh, he was uh, downcast. Um, it doesn't look like many people believed in him at all. Um, it, it just seems like he was an object failure. But what was the reality? The reality was he won the biggest victory. He won the best of possible worlds is going to happen where God's will is done on earth. It's going to happen because he destroyed the power of sin and death for those who believe. He, he has now triumphed over the grave by his resurrection, even though the public doesn't know it, the world doesn't know it. They still think he's a failure. They still think that way is stupid. Now, guess what? When people see people living as Christians and when they hear what they believe, a lot of them are going to say, that's just stupid. That's a waste of time. That's too good to be true or it's just ridiculous or it's a myth. And uh, they're going to say, that's not going to bring you happiness. It's nothing. The absolute opposite is the truth. It is the one way. It is the only way to find truth. It is the only plan that really, in the end, really delivers on happiness, that really um, gives us what we need, the significance, the love, the belonging. And, and it works in a couple ways. It works first by our being connected with God himself directly, but it also helps us connect with the other believers, just like Jesus connected those precious disciples together at the beginning. They were had a unity with God, and as they were unified with God, they were also unified with each other. And they needed to not go into this world alone. We're not sent alone. God is with us, and we have each other. That is huge. Jesus prayed for that. Keep them one, Lord. Keep them together. And again, the other thing was the truth, the words that Jesus said. Every word that proceeds from the mouth of God is what we live by. So here again, it's letting what Jesus teaches, what the Bible says. And he says the Bible is the words of God. He quoted that in the wilderness experience. He said to the devil, we're to live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And, and, and we need to know those words. And, and some of those words are like this. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And that's in the context of hard circumstances where we don't have enough food, where we're challenged, where things don't make sense, where we don't have an earthly success, where we, we're empty, we look defeated. And yet we'll have all the strength we need to do whatever we need to do to fulfill the plan, God's plan, that really works to happiness. But we have to know that plan, we have to believe in that plan, and we have to give up the plans of the earth. We have to give up earthly dreams and ambitions and powers because they just weakly go after what we really need. And that's real love, real existence, real glory, real honor, real virtue, real relationship. And the only place we're going to find that is with God himself who made it all in the first place. And he made it for good. Another scripture that's really important here to feed ourselves that we live by every day is, is that we need to rejoice always, be grateful in all circumstances. Why? Because we're victors in it no matter what. And that's, that, that's really critical that we, despite it all, we can face dying of cancer, we can face uh, difficult times and challenges with a certain security, a certain joy and peace, that circumstances that the world, circumstances of the world, same thing, can't take from us, okay? So we got to live in that. So we got to live in these words. An an another word is, is that God, for those who love him and are called according to his purpose, and again, I pointed out, those are the people that are in this world that are sent into this world in their view to do God's plan. They're believing in God's plan. They're trusting God to work his plan. And those are the ones that love God, those that hallow God, those that make 
God who he is and let him be who he is. And don't allow that to be changed or messed with and know that he is the only one. Those that worship that way and know God that way and, and follow his plan that way can know this. That all things, not some things, not just the good things, not the things we like, but all things work to our good. And that has the power of God behind it. Nothing can stop it. Now, if we really believe that, we're in the world in a different way. We're not of that world. We're holy. We're transformed by his word. We live by his word. But we live different. We can live different. And anyone can. Childlike faith. This is for the childlike. We can experience that. You don't have to be a rocket scientist. You just have to have a sincere heart. And so here we are. We can experience a kind of presence in this world that we have a mission we're sent in this world with a power, not a fear, as Paul points out, not a spirit of fear, which comes, the doorway to fear is pride. And once pride lets it in, it'll dominate your destiny forever. It's sort of like the dark side of the force. Fear doesn't dominate, doesn't rule us. No, that's of the world. No, what dominates us is a spirit from God. And it comes from us doing his plan and believing his word and making him hallowed. Okay, it comes from those things. We have a spirit of power, love, and sound mind. And guys, I've been looking for a sound mind. I've been looking for a sane sanity in all my life. I've been looking for something like this. I've been looking for that plan. And now God gives it us in Jesus Christ. He gives it to us because we're sent into this world. We're sent in as his priests. We're sent in not as orphans. We're not alone. We have him and each other. So let's be in the world and be all that God makes us to be for his glory, for our joy, and for a happiness that is real and will not go away or fade, but grow greater and greater. That's why we're in the world. Thank you.